ready. Such ordinary things make me afraid. Sunshine, sharp shadows on grass, white roses, children with red hair, and the name Harry. Harry, such an ordinary name. Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight by Michael McCabe. Harry, such an ordinary name, yet the first time Christine mentioned it, I felt a premonition of fear. She was five years old, due to start school in three months' time. It was a hot, beautiful day, and she was playing alone in the garden, as she often did. I saw her lying on her stomach in the grass, picking daisies and making daisy chains with laborious pleasure. The sun burned on her pale red hair and made her skin look very white and lovely. Her big blue eyes were wide with concentration. Suddenly, she looked towards the bush of white roses, which cast its shadow over the grass, and smiled. Yes, I'm Christine. She rose and walked slowly towards the bush, her plump little legs defenseless and endearing beneath the too short cotton skirt. She was growing fast. Where's my mummy and daddy? Oh, there are my mummy and daddy. Chris? Chris, what are you doing? Nothing. Well, come indoors now, darling. Goodbye, Miss Kalina. Goodbye. Chris? Who are you talking to? Harry. And who's Harry? I couldn't get anything else out of her, so I just gave her some cake and milk and read to her until bedtime. As she listened, she stared out at the garden. Once she smiled and waved. It was a relief finally to tuck her up in bed and feel she was safe. Oh, that's not okay, eh? What do you mean, Jim? Well, it's not so rare for only children to have an imaginary companion. I had one myself called Oz. Used to talk to him all the time. Oh. Well, some kids talk to their dolls. Chris has never been very keen on dolls. She hasn't any brothers or sisters, so uh, she talks to... Uh, what was it? Who did you say? Harry. Harry. Well, she hasn't any friends of her own age, so she imagines someone. Harry. But, but Jim, why has she picked that particular name? <laughs> you know how kids pick things up. I don't know what you're worrying about. Honestly, I don't. Well, I'm not worrying exactly. It's just that I... When I feel extra responsible for her. More so than if I were her real mother. Sure. Sure, but Chris is all right. Chris is fine. She's a pretty, healthy, intelligent little girl. <laughs> a credit to you. <laughs> and to you. In fact, a thoroughly nice parent. <laughs> oh, yes. And so modest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's silly of me, I know, but... Oh, I just get a bit worried sometimes. I feel better now. You always make me feel better. I felt consoled until the next morning. Again the sun shone brilliantly on the small bright lawn and white roses. Christine was sitting on the grass, cross-legged, staring towards the rose bush, smiling. Hello. I hoped you'd come. Because I like you. How old are you? I'm only five and a bit. I'm not a baby. I'm going to school soon 
I was going to have a new dress. Oh yes, I did go for a little while. Infant school. But I didn't stay very long because we moved. Daddy had to go somewhere else for his work. And... Yes, this time I'm going to start big school properly. And I'll stay there for years and years and years. And I'm going to have a green dress. Do you go to school? Well, what do you do then? I felt myself going cold as I stood listening to her. Don't be silly, I told myself. Lots of children have an imaginary companion. Just carry on as if nothing were happening. Don't be a fool. But I called Chris in earlier than usual for mid-morning milk. Can Harry come too? No. Goodbye, Harry. I'm sorry you can't come in, but I've got to have my milk. Why can't Harry have some milk? Who is Harry, darling? Harry. He's my brother. But, Chris, you haven't got a brother. Daddy and Mummy have only got one child, one little girl, and that's you. Harry can't be your brother, darling. Yes, Harry's my brother. He said so. She drank her milk and emerged with a smeary top lip. And then she grabbed at a plate of biscuits. Well, at least Harry hadn't spoiled her appetite. He's your brother. He says so, does he? Oh, yes. He's not. I must have my new dress soon because I want to show him, Mummy. It says green's a nice colour. Well, I wish Harry could come to my new school with me. He'd be able to look after me. He said he wouldn't look after me. Does it come? Right, thank you. I'll say one thing for imaginary companions. They help the child that they're talking. With an accent. Accent? A cockney accent. <laughs> Today, Chris... Well, she started speaking to me with a... With a, a sort of cockney accent. Just a slight one. <laughs> My dearest, every London child gets a slight cockney accent. It'll be even worse when she gets to school. I mean, the big school meets all the other kids. Don't worry. We don't talk Cockney, Jim. Where does she get it from? June. Who oh, can she be getting it from except her? The butcher, the baker, the milkman, the coalman, the, the window cleaner. Want any more? I suppose not. Oh, I'm so silly, but I... I can't help it. It's just that... Well, darling, everything was so nice, so happy till... till this Harry business. Do you know what I think? I think you should put your mind at rest. What? Take Chris along to see old Dr. Webster tomorrow. Let him have a little talk with her. Jimmy, do you think she's ill? In her mind? Oh, good heavens, no. It's just that you're obviously upset about it. You, well, you don't understand. And when we meet something we don't understand, it's as well to take professional advice, that's all. That's what doctors are for. That's what they take a couple of quid from my salary every week for. Go and see Webster. Yes, I will. Here, have a cigarette. Thank you. It's a fairly unusual case, Mrs. James, but by no means unique. I've had several cases of children's imaginary friends becoming so real to them that their parents get the jitters. Now, uh, Christine's rather a lonely little girl, isn't she? Oh, she won't be when she goes to school again, but... Well, I suppose she is at the moment, yes. <laughs> she doesn't know any other children. We're, we're quite new to the neighborhood. Yes, you, you moved, haven't you? Well, I think you'll find these fantasies will disappear when she gets to school and meets the other children. At the moment, this friend of hers is a compensation for real children. You see... Every child needs company of her own age. If she doesn't get it, well, she invents it. Older people who are lonely, they talk to themselves, but that doesn't mean that they're crazy or anything. It's just that, uh, well, they need somebody to talk to. Yes. The child is more practical. Seems silly to talk to oneself, says the child, so uh, it invents another, a real person. Oh, I don't think you've got anything to worry about. Oh, that's what my husband says. Well, I'm sure he does. Still, 
I'll have a chat with her as you bought her. Oh, yes. Uh, leave us alone together, hmm? Yes. Christine, just come here a minute, will you, darling? Hello, oh, sweetie. Where, well, Chris? Yeah. See, Mummy, down there by the rose bush. It's just like our rose bush, isn't it? Do you see? <laughs> There's no one there. Now, Dr. Webster wants to see you. Now, you remember him, don't you? He gave you sweets when you were getting better with chicken pox. Hello, <coughs> Christine. My, you're growing. Shooting up. She went into Webster's surgery willingly enough. I waited restlessly. <laughs> she was talking away to the doctor in a way she never talked to me. You see, I knew then that he would be full of reassurances when they came out. But I was afraid. Awfully afraid. And the ridiculous thing was I couldn't put my fear into words. Harry is waiting. By the rose bush. See him? Nothing wrong with her, whatever. She's just an imaginative little monkey, that's all. A word of advice, Mrs. James. Let her talk about Harry. Let her become accustomed to confiding in you. I gather you've shown some uh, disapproval of this brother of hers. So he doesn't talk much to you about him. Christine? Hmm? He makes wooden toys, doesn't he, Chris? And he can read and write, can't he? Yes, and swim, and paint, and climb trees. He can do everything. You see? Sounds quite a wonderful brother to me. He's even got red hair like you, hasn't he? Harry's got red hair. Redder than mine, too. And he's nearly as tall as Daddy, only thinner. He's as tall as you, Mummy. He's 14. <laughs> Don't you worry, Mrs. James. You let her prattle. Thank you, Doctor. Goodbye, Chris. Give on up to Harry. Harry's got red hair. Harry can swim. Harry can light fires. Harry can read and he can walk too. Harry's got red hair. Red as his Harry, Harry, nothing but Harry. He can swim and fish and paint and burn the box. But you're looking forward to school, Chris. You know you oh, are. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, he'll, he'll feel silly. A great lad of 14 amongst all those little children. I won't go to school without Harry. I won't. I won't. I won't. Chris, I'm sorry, darling. I, I didn't mean... You see, darling, it's just that... Well, you wouldn't like Harry to be unhappy, would you? Would you? daylight, golden shadows and long strips of sunlight in the garden. Then, almost like a dream, the long, thin, clear-cut shadow of a boy near the white roses. Harry! I thought I saw a glimmer of red among the trees, among the roses, like close red curls on a boy's head. Then, there was nothing. The next day, I started on my secret mission. I took a bus to town and went to the big, gaunt building I hadn't visited for over five years. Then, Jim and I had gone together. The top floor of this building belonged to the Grey Thorn Adoption Society. Mrs. James, how nice to see you again. How's Christine? My goodness, it must be four years at least. Oh, it's, it's more than five, Miss Cleaver. Well, well, well Chris is very well. Miss Cleaver, I'd better get straight to the point. I, I know you don't normally tell people about a child's origins, not even to the child's adopters, but I, 
I must know who Christine is. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, but I will please. Oh. Let me tell you the whole story, and, and, and you'll see I, I'm not just suffering from vulgar curiosity. Yes. All right, then. Uh, please, won't you sit down? Thank you. Miss Cleaver. <clears throat> it's very queer. Very queer indeed, Mrs. James. Look, I'm going to break our rule for once. I'm going to tell you in confidence where Christine came from. Thank you. She was born in a very poor part of London. There were four in the family. Father, mother, son, and Christine herself. Son? Yes. The parents hadn't really wanted Christine. Family lived in one room at the top of a very old house, which should have been condemned by the sanitary inspector, in my opinion. It was difficult enough when there were only three of them. But with a baby as well, life became a nightmare. The mother was a neurotic creature, slatternly, unhappy, too fat. After she had the baby, she took no interest in it. Brother, however, adored the little thing right from the start. He constantly got into trouble for cutting school so that he could look after her. Uh, Christine. Yes? One morning in the small hours, a woman on the ground floor saw something fall past her window. She heard a thud on the ground outside. She went out to look and found the son of the family there, on the ground. Christine was in his arms. The boy's neck was broken. He was dead. The little girl was blue in the face, but still breathing faintly. The woman worked the household, sent for the police and the doctor, and they went to the top room. They had to break the door down because it was locked and sealed inside. The window was open, but there was an overpowering smell of gas. They found the husband and wife dead in bed. There was a note from the husband. It said, I can't go on. I am going to kill them all. It's the only way. The police concluded that he'd sealed up the doors and windows, turned on the gas when his family were asleep, and lain down beside his wife until he drifted into unconsciousness and death. But the son must have woken up. Perhaps he struggled with the door, but couldn't open it. He'd been too weak to shout. All he could do was pluck away the seals from the window, open it, and fling himself out, holding his adored little sister tightly in his arm. So her brother saved her life and died himself? Yes. He was a very brave little boy. Perhaps he thought not so much of saving her as keeping her with him. But dear, that, that sounds ungenerous. I, I didn't mean to be Miss Cleaver. What was his name, the brother? Oh, I'll have to look that up for you. I'm glad Christine is well, though. I'd be most grateful if you'd uh, count this information as secret between you and me, Mrs. James. As I said, we've never before... Oh, um... The family's name was... Jones. The 14-year-old brother was Harold. Come, Harry. Come, too. Goodbye, Harry. I'm sorry you can't come in, but I've got to have my milk. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Harry. What does it all mean? I, I can't understand. It's not easy. But I think deep in her unconscious mind, Christine has always remembered Harry, the companion of her babyhood. We don't think of children as having much memory, but there must be images of the past tucked away somewhere in their little heads. Christine doesn't invent this Harry. She remembers him so clearly that she almost brought him back to life again. May I have the address of the house where they lived, please? The house seemed deserted. It was filthy and derelict. But one thing made me stare and stare. 
There was a tiny garden, a scatter of bright, uneven grass splashed the bald brown patches of earth. But the little garden had one strange glory that none of the other houses in the poor, sad street possessed. A bush of white roses. What are you doing here? Oh, I... I thought the house was empty. Should be. Being condemned. They can't get me out. Nowhere else to go. Won't go. The others went quickly enough after it happened. No one else wants to come. They say the place is haunted. So it is, but what's the fuss about? Life and death, they're very close. You get to know that when you're old, alive or dead, what's the difference? Yes. I saw him fall past the window. What? That's where he fell, among the roses. Oh, he still comes back, I see him. He won't go away till he gets her. Who? Who are you talking about? Harry Jones. Oh, nice boy he was, red hair, very thin. Too determined, though, always got his own way. Loved the little girl too much, I thought. Died among the roses. Used to sit down there with her for hours. Then he died there. Or do people die? Nobody's got any answers, no one nowhere. For you! Dead who ain't dead and living who I hurried across the bright, hot pavements, and my legs felt heavy and half paralyzed. I lost all sense of time. Then I heard the clock strike three, and it chilled my blood. At three o'clock, I was supposed to be at the school gate, waiting for Christine. I've come for Christine James. I'm her mother. I'm so sorry. I'm late. Where is she? Christine James? Oh, yes, I remember. She's new. With a little red-haired girl. That's all right, Mrs. James. Her brother called for her. How alike they are, aren't they? And so devoted. It's rather strange. <laughs> The futile search continued for months. The papers were full of the strange disappearance of the red-haired child. The teacher described the brother who had called for her. There were stories circulated about kidnapping, baby-snatching, child murders. Then the sensation died down. It became just another unsolved mystery in police files. And only two people knew what happened. An old, crazed woman living in a derelict house, and myself. Such ordinary things make me afraid. Sunshine, sharp shadows on grass, white roses, children with red hair, and the name Harry. Such an 
ordinary name. program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McKay. Accident. Automobile accident. Over.